Thanks, uh, and uh, thanks for coming. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm Sam Skillman. I work at a startup called Descartes Labs. Uh, the rest of the folks here are my uh, are all at Descartes Labs as well, and I'll be talking about processing a petabyte of planetary pixels with Python. Uh, and really, that's a lie. I'm going to talk about processing petabytes of planetary pixels with Python. So disclaimer, my opinions are my own. I kind of go off the cuff, so who knows what will happen. Uh, so Descartes Labs, first of all, it's a venture-backed startup, uh, spun out of Los Alamos National Lab in 2014. Uh, our kind of broad goal is building a first living atlas of the globe using uh, publicly and privately available satellite imagery. Our first big commercial application is monitoring globally real-time forecasts of how much food is going to be produced around the world. So to do that, uh, there's a few things that you might think you might need if you're going to be processing a petabyte of pixels. Uh, one is large compute capacity. Uh, you're going to be looking for global satellite imagery coverage, petabytes of imagery. And on top of that, you want fast, simple data access to that satellite imagery, uh, which will allow you to enable fast development iterations. So if you're to this traditionally, you might start by going to USGS maybe poking around, finding some Landsat data that covers the area that you want. That doesn't work so well if you're trying to download all of the data. Uh, and so we really need to get beyond this type of interface where you browse around and then click and download and open up a big tarball and run out of space on your hard drive. OK, so what are we going to do instead? Well, there's a few enabling technologies that are going to allow us to iterate quickly over such a massive data set. Uh, the first is the, first of all, having the available to the availability of the public uh, uh, satellite imagery. Uh, and the second key part of this is uh, access to cloud compute resources. Companies like Amazon and Google have all this excess capacity when they aren't at peak usage, which they are happy to sell us at a, uh, a rate that's pretty affordable. What does that do? It means you don't have to invest in any capital to start up your own data center. You can have very simple system administration, and it's reliable, and it's scalable. Right? This is Google scale, Amazon scale. So uh, this is a, a, a table that Mike Warren uh, really loves and made in 2015. Uh, and it talks about the, the real cost of computing at this stage in our uh, uh, computing ability. And you can kind of look from the top to the bottom. It's in, in increasing cost as you go from the top to the bottom. And what you kind of look is you can store a whole lot of data on something like cloud storage very cheaply for quite a long time. Uh, as you go kind of down, you're, you're really seeing the cost of moving information around. You know, you're going from being local uh, you know, on some disk storage to communicating within a, a CPU. You get out to local network where you're pushing data around maybe the internal Google network or, or something like that. Then you're going to wide area networks, and then you kind of get to the point where it costs about the same to either employ a human to write like a line of code or you know, get some data out to the public internet. And so, uh, you know, for example, a dollar can let you upload eight gigs to the internet. You can store a gig in, in memory for a week. You can uh, compute. 10 of the 15 flops, which is quite a lot. And you can buy one minute of programming language, uh, of labor. So you can see what the real cost is here uh, that's going to be limiting you. It's the, the cost of good software. So using that cloud infrastructure, what do we have? We have you know, about a petabyte or more of satellite imagery. They're all in these different formats. Uh, there's multiple data sources. There's FTP servers. There's click to download. There's all sorts of different units and scaling. And you know who knows what else is going on to get between you and the data that you want to analyze. And what we really want is a nice, clean, unified data format that's going to save you programming hours because your new employees or users don't have to think about what data format this is in anymore. It's one thing. You want a unified interface because that's going to save you headaches from having all sorts of different web APIs or uh, uh, data access methods. And you really want calibrated data. You want something like top of atmosphere reflectance uh, that eases your path to doing multi-sensor fusion, where you're combining many different satellites all into one uh, data product. 
And finally, as an economical point, you want you know, fairly good compression of this, this data, save money. So our first set of sensors that we started looking at, uh, the company, again, is only a year and a half, almost two years old. Uh, this was back in kind of April of 2015. Uh, we decided this is a good starting point to tackle to see if we can get all of this data into kind of this common data interface. So you're going from 1973 for Landsat 1 uh, up till uh, kind of recent, semi-recently launched Landsat 8. Uh, MODIS, uh, low, lower resolution satellite imagery comes in uh, around the 2000s. And this is kind of the, the input data set that we decided to tackle first. So if you look at that and you, you kind of plot the amount of data that's publicly available as a function of time, you see that, uh, this is a, a log linear plot here, uh, you see that just at the kind of uh, March, April of 2015, if you combined uh, MODIS and Landsat, you were just approaching that petabyte scale, which seemed like a nice time to maybe think about doing something fun. So our challenge to ourselves for no real reason other than to make our lives easier in the future was pre-process all 40 years of Landsat and MODIS imagery uh, in a day, okay? So that means taking all these BZIP geotiffs that are in all sorts of different units and you know, transforming that into a clean, tiled JPEG 2000 compressed data set, top of atmosphere reflectance, Nice, clean data. So we attacked this with uh, Google Cloud resources. We were combining our in-house technology with Python and GDAL, fantastic uh, packages, NumPy. Uh, and this is the, the symbol for uh, Google Compute uh, CPU. Well, we're not going to just use one CPU. That's not going to handle a petabyte of imagery and do that in a day. We're going to use 15,000 CPUs, 30,000 virtual CPUs. So we started scaling up on uh, Google Compute and uh, hit go. 16 hours. 16 hours later, we had processed a petabyte of imagery that you can see in the, the blue line. Now that petabyte of imagery is actually the compressed imagery. It's, it's this B-zipped, uh, mostly B-zipped compressed imagery. Uncompressed, it's over three petabytes of data. We compress that down in JPEG 2000 down to uh, uh, just a, a fraction of that. But 16 hours processed the entire like, catalog of Earth observation data using Python tools in the cloud. That's just kind of fun. Uh, one crazy number in my mind, like beyond just processing that amount of data was the, the network flow that you can access through cloud compute. And uh, our peak that we kind of saw, this is a, a screenshot of uh, the processing going on, was showing like 23 gigabytes a second of network bandwidth into and uh, about uh, eight gigabytes a second out of compute. So that's an incredible network bandwidth. I came from high performance computing in the computational astrophysics world. If you think about doing that in a traditional supercomputing center, uh, you just would start kind of chuckling to yourself. So at the end of this, we had imagery all the way from Landsat 1. This is uh, the Austin area for locals who recognize it. Uh, Landsat 5, Landsat 8. And it's all clean. It's all in a very usable interface for us to start applying all sorts of analysis and machine learning techniques on top of. Uh, so I want to do a little bit of a demo uh, for what uh, some of this would look like, uh, just to prove that we have analyzed and made available a lot of this imagery. This is a mosaic of Landsat 8 from June of this year. Uh, one thing I, I didn't quite appreciate being an astronomer, even though I, I guess I should have since we were looking up instead of down, is the Earth is quite cloudy. And so you can see lots of uh, clouds everywhere. But you can zoom in and you can you know, go into the non-cloudy areas like Chicago. And you know, this is what Chicago looks like last month. We've also used this interface to make cloud-free mosaics. Uh, and so here is where we're kind of blending and determining the best combination of all the available pixels to provide one cloud-free global mosaic. 
Uh, and this is uh, a mosaic of MODIS data from the last two days. And, and if you zoom into where Austin is here, it's a little tricky to see. This was like this morning. Uh, and so it was, I guess it was partly cloudy today. Uh, we've processed other imagery since that. This is uh, 2014 uh, National Aerial Imagery Program. Uh, and so uh, this is one meter resolution imagery and kind of a fun place to go is like Washington DC and like that's the Washington Monument, otherwise known as the world's tallest sundial. Okay, so you know that's fine. You put it in a map. Everyone's seen maps. Uh, you're not going to just run, you know, some algorithm in Python and you know maybe Scikit-Learn or Cafe or uh, TensorFlow, all the new rage. Uh, so you you need some interface to that data. I'm going to show you kind of the the remote interface through the Python request library, but we have internal uh, Python only imagery access. Uh, uh, that does the same thing. So one thing you might want to do, I'm going to clear all this so that you know I'm honest. Uh, you know, first thing you might want to do is query for some satellite imagery. You're, you're a grad student, you're thinking about some project you want to look at, you know, what's going on in Travis County, Texas. Uh, you make some request that looks at, you know, what the start and end date that you're looking for. You do some uh, some listings of what some of the metadata is, and we're going to look for some some cloud-free imagery and and when it was acquired. It looks like uh, there's a Landsat 8 image uh, that was taken about a week ago, uh, and it's fairly low uh, cloud fraction, so that might be a good one to look at. And now we want to request the imagery, um, and so it wasn't that fast. Um, uh, we're going to take that that key there, we're going to ask for a set of bands, we're going to scale some of that radiance values uh, to something we care about, we're going to ask for a 30 meter resolution, uh, and we're going to just request that raster and then uh, plot it here. And here's uh, Travis County from uh, about a week ago. So that's a pretty easy way if you think of comparing that to clicking around and searching through something like Earth Explorer. Uh, searching for that imagery, downloading it, untarring the 800 megabyte tar file. Uh, so that's fine. You might also want to do things like get derived bands. Um, so here I'm just asking for a different set, including something like near infrared, calculating NDVI, which is kind of characteristic of you know, uh, vegetation. Uh, and so you can start to look at that, and you can see that, OK, the lakes are uh, they don't reflect any near infrared, but some of the, the grassy areas around Austin are, are flourishing. Uh, that's fine. Now, you know, that's cool. Look at Austin. That's great. You're probably not going to write like a paper or make any grand uh, uh, claims after just looking at a, a county. And so uh, let's scale that up to Texas. And really all that I had to change here was the location I was looking at. Uh, I uh, changed the date range so that I could get a wider range of Landsat images. I uh, make the same types of requests. A lot of this is just boilerplate. And it takes a little bit longer because, as you can imagine, Texas is a large state. But at the end, not, you know, that wasn't too long. Here's 96 composite Landsat 8 images, and you're showing the same NDVI scaling. There's some holes in there because these are. I selected some of the cloud-free images, and so that part of Texas, I guess, was cloudy during that, that time. So that's, I think, pretty powerful. You can go from looking at very small-scale individual images to doing state scale, and internally we're doing global scale. Doesn't happen quite that uh, interactively, but uh, it's fast enough. Uh, so the next thing that's, I think, kind of interesting uh, is, is looking at something like the growth of uh, Las Vegas. And so Las Vegas is in Clark County, Nevada. We're going to take a look at 1986 uh, in like March. Uh, this is look using Landsat 5. You just same kind of boilerplate code. Um, again, there's like we use uh, an internal Python API that's very similar to this. 
So here's, here's Clark County in 1986. Here's the main city region in here. Uh, you notice the size of the, the lakes around the city. And then we changed this to be 2016. Uh, earlier this year, Landsat 8 this time. And the same type of interface shows you this. And the city has grown to a much larger size, and the water has gone away. So anyways, those are a few quick uh, examples of, of how we're to prove to you that we're really capable of analyzing this crazy backlog of, of satellite imagery very easily, all built on and using Python, which has been just a whole lot of fun to program. OK. So a couple other applications, uh, more of the machine learning type sides of things. Uh, the USDA puts out something called the CropScape data layer, uh, which is a classification of what the land use is uh, across the US. Uh, what you're seeing here is yellow is corn and green is soybeans. This is some part of the Midwest. Uh, and <laughs> I, I don't know where. <laughs> uh, and what we've been able to do, because we have this access to imagery and have this very fast development time scale, is we've developed machine learning algorithms that can recalculate this from incoming imagery to extremely good accuracy. This is just flipping back and forth here. There's a couple of pixels here and there, but it's, it's really quite a good match. Uh, we also use this to do global land use land classification. So this is type of you know, global scale analysis that you, you need all of the data to, to be able to even attempt to do this. As I mentioned before, we, we work on doing cloud-free mosaics. This is uh, another snapshot of, of MODIS data. Uh, we also look not only where crops are and, and identifying them, we also look at how healthy they are and how much, uh, you know, how much food they're actually going to produce. So you can look at things like vegetative health at you know, country global scale. This is a, I, I love this color map. Uh, good on all the fantastic improvements in color maps in the Python community. Uh, so in terms of our, our data velocity, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, oops. Just wanted to show this is a Landsat 8 imagery coming in all of 2015, all of last year. Uh, so up until uh, kind of last week-ish, we've processed about half a petabyte of Landsat 8 imagery alone, uh, about a petabyte when you consider the full backlog of Landsat imagery. Get about half a terabyte a day. Uh, Sentinel 2A is processing. We're at about 220 terabytes and processing uh, one and a half terabytes a day. That's uh, kind of like a petabyte every two to three years of new incoming imagery. Uh, and we have some private satellite imagery that we're also processing, also approaching the petabyte scale. Uh, that's coming in at uh, ever-increasing data rates. Uh, this is the, it kind of looks like a, to me it looks like piano keys. But uh, this is just showing every day all the new observations that come in from Landsat. So you, every eight or so, 16 days, uh, you get coverage in any given area across the US. And that, that's all using you know, Python, NumPy, GDAL, and our interfaces to this imagery. Uh, there's no crazy batch processing that's going on. This is just me at a terminal making a visualization. Uh, so what happens to your workflow? You go from working with a handful of Landsat scenes to working globally. Like you have access to essentially unlimited compute. That's what you can do. You go from creating local models of how corn or soy grows to doing country and global scale models that have to work everywhere. They can't just work on Uncle John's farm. Uh, you get massive amounts of discovery space when you move to this scale of, of planetary uh, geospatial analysis. It takes you know, weeks, months to go between the design stages of your research or, or company's application to the delivery of that. Uh, if you're working off of old interfaces, 
now you're really only limited by how fast you can think, how fast you can move, how fast you can program new analysis modules. Uh, and you know, really, the, the, the big thing is you go from having tons and tons of FTP server woes to just pure joy working directly with imagery, no messing around. So with that, I just want to thank you to all the Cartesians back at Descartes Labs, uh, the 2016 SciPy organizers, and the full uh, SciPy stack. None of this is possible without the, the continued amazing work done in, done in open source software. Uh, and at a last, last kind of plug here, we're hiring, looking for fantastic uh, people and programmers, whether it's geospatial is your thing, to machine learning, to just software development, uh, please come talk to me. We have a pretty nice place up in Los Alamos. This is us having a pizza party right next to a canyon. It's not your typical startup scene, I don't think. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so all of our stuff we're converting primarily to JPEG 2000, and there are uh, painful but uh, capable metadata schemes that you can implant in that, and so we primarily use that. Um, we really need the like uh, multi-scale, multi-resolution aspects of some of that, so HDF5 doesn't quite expose that type of interface, um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But. Right, so that's a good point. Uh, uh, a lot of our stuff we use like Celery for task-based queues and um, a couple different monitoring pieces of software. Uh, kind of, you know, really we tried out a few things. A few things worked. A few things didn't. Uh, but Celery and and just like the standard Google Compute tools were were efficient to do almost all of this. Uh, we also make uh, extensive use of like Docker, like container technology to to ease deployment. Sure, yeah. Uh, yep. Sure, sure. Yeah, and so, you know, there's, there's lots of different interfaces. We need something that is extremely fast and efficient, uh, primarily within the kind of cloud infrastructure that we have. So uh, th that's kind of what we need. Colors, yeah. Yeah, and so, so Landsat 1 is tricky because it doesn't have a blue band, so that was a false color image of that one. That, that was the, the biggest uh, difference there, but. Yes, yeah, 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 right, yeah. Yeah, full, full like, converting everything into kind of top atmosphere reflectance and, and color calibration, all that sort of stuff, so. No. I, I had not heard of that, but uh, I he was asking, had I heard of uh, Kia? Yeah. Yeah. K yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, lo I'd love to take a look. Always interested. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, so the question is, what about losing information due to JPEG 2000 compression? Uh, we did a, a, a pretty extensive test to see how much that affects our machine learning algorithms for what we cared about for our applications. And uh, we kind of chose the right compression uh, ratios such that it didn't affect the, the results coming out. And so we did that study before and kind of chose what was OK, because you're right, it does screw things up if you aren't careful about it. But, yeah. In terms of PSNR, what is the percentage of the 
I don't have the number with me in my head, so sorry. Yeah, yeah, so uh, asking about uh, if we'd looked at lossless JPEG 2000 and what library we're using for JPEG 2000 encoding and decoding. Uh, we do use some uh, lossless encoding and decoding for some of the imagery. Um, and then uh, we found that uh, using some of the, uh, one of the proprietary Kakadu libraries was the, was the fastest, so. Yeah, I, I, I've used OpenJPEG and, and that kind of stuff as well, um, and yeah. 